Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Sonic Lab presentation. It's that time of year when we catch up with our friends over at Bitwig. We've got Dave Lindenbank there over at Bitwig HQ. This is the view we're very familiar. I th I'm pretty sure your collection of synthesizers is growing, Dave. Is that uh, is that correct? It looks like there's more. It, uh, well, you know, we've been indoors, so there's been uh, a little bit of accumulation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's always always a new one. We don't get rid of too many. That's the problem. Well, I, I can totally uh, identify with that. So, Dave, um, we're looking at quite a major upgrade. This is a point. This is a, a point zero update to uh, Bitwig. So we're now at version four point oh, right? Hey, Nick. Yeah, that's right. This is a uh, version four oh that is out now. It's our fifteenth update. Uh, the general focus of it is some DAW centric features. Uh, new musical timelines is the thought behind it, and uh, I'd like to show you a little bit of how that connects in the program. Excellent. So we've got that up on the screen. This is the 4.0 uh, I can see here. So what it looks a little bit different to me. There's, I mean, is there much visual change? It does look like there's a little bit of change there, but I couldn't quite put my finger on what. Well, like the list of keyboards, there's always enough visual change so that it feels new and welcoming. Uh, these little icons that are appearing now might be the clearest giveaway that comping, audio comping is now part of Bitwig, so we can focus on that for a moment. If I go ahead and, and hit play. This little audio clip that I've got going on is actually a comped audio clip. And what it allows in Bitwig is that everything is living inside of the clip itself. So this, all the take lanes are actually inside of the clip. That's why I have this separate editor for dealing with it. If I were to go ahead and drag it over into the clip launcher, because we do have two timelines, we try to fully support them. Uh, now, I've got this same clip happening inside of the launcher. Now that means a couple things. It means you can also record new comp material in like a cycle recording way, either in the arranger or in the launcher. It's, it's up to you. Wherever you're working, wherever you're comfortable, that's all supported now. So we could dig into this feature a little bit more, the more, the way you would see it starting from scratch. Right. Um, so if I switch over to this other track, I have kind of a freshly recorded comp take here, and maybe I'll put this in our larger edit view mode just so you can see it a little bit clearer. If I had just recorded this in, probably my first step is just to play the different takes and hear what's going on. So I'll double click the second one. Okay, things are a little bit different. Maybe I'll mix up a chord here. I like that ending point. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead. I've got the first take. If I just click and drag, then you're already seeing on the composite up top that every take lane has its own unique color that is then being put on the top just so you have some clarity uh, of where things are coming from. So if I go All right, nice. Again. Okay, the timing feels a little bit off. Um, so if I go ahead and just hover over that second chord hit that I've got here, I have a slide gesture just built into the program already. Um, and this has been added not just to comping, but to audio editing in general. So if you're inside the detail editor now, it's just easy to give things a little bit more of a groove and it actually feels a lot more musical. Um, that feels good. And then uh, nicely, a couple other things that we thought about were, you know, you start by just trying to select a take, you have a pile of them. The arrow keys are a pretty good interface. So we've just mapped it directly on here. If I just press the up arrow, I can go ah, ahead and take right. the selected take. That's not the one. That's not bad. It's a little bit quiet. Maybe I'll just mouse over the top, do a slight gain adjustment there. That's it, we're comping, we're off to the races. Um, and for our vocalist friends, we've made it easy if I'm kind of over an edge here to just go ahead and remove a little bit of section when you're dealing with breaths and other things that get into the recording. Um, just trying to streamline it and keep it as simple and visual as possible. Yeah, and then so, the, I, I like the way that you can uh, adjust the, it, it looks like the sort of anchor and stretching points from within the within the editor, that's pretty neat. 
Nice. Yeah, no, there's, there's a lot in there where it's just bent around and it's trying to make it as simple as possible, especially for the repetitive tasks. I mean, something that, that sounds silly, but oh, I've recorded all these takes, I need to start. They're just off by a little bit. I had a latency issue or my hardware synth or whatever. Okay, well, if I look down in the window footer, sure, I could go to a take and hold down alt, or now I add shift two, and oh, I just need to slide everything by that little bit. You know, there's just these moments where you need small gestures to save you a lot of time. And we've, we've tried to do that. Um, in a similar way, all of these gestures also work if you go over to our layered editing mode. So, you know, whether you've got an acoustic guitar, you've recorded the pickup and a microphone, and you just want to edit the comps together because it's one performance with two sources, it works exactly the same. So all of these gestures would just apply to all of the comps you're looking on screen at one time. So it, it's not any more complicated. It's just as simple as it is right now. And so um, can you just, do you bounce it or can you, is it like a, always a live comp and can you drag other bits of audio in to sort of create random comping for, for those kind of effects as well? Sure, sure. Well, it's, it's a live comp. We've actually rethought that part a little bit. Uh, yes, I could go ahead and take something from the browser and drag anything in and just get it up on top. Forgive my little noise there. <laughs> uh, right. of, of demoing the audio, yes. So I, I can add anything in just by dropping it into the comp itself. But we've rethought it a little bit because comping is a really interesting workflow. Um, so there might be a different way to work with it. Something I've got here, and I'm, I'm not trying to out you, Nick, but maybe you've got some of these too, is a recording of some analog synthesizer noodling that, it, oh good, it's 385 plus bars long because that's just what happens some days. And and it seemed like the perfect thing at the time, but now I don't have a way to use it. So a different way to explore comping, I can take any audio clip that's in here, I can go ahead and click on it and say, I want to fold this to takes. So now I can wrap the thing around, okay, well, 99 takes, that's quite a bit. Uh, uh, okay. Three bars is a bit more manageable. Maybe I'll even shrink that down to two because that feels a little bit more like a loop. And now I've got all those same gestures as a way of just exploring whatever this audio is and maybe finding a way to use it because, you know, 20 minute improvisations don't always make it in music. So if I pick some different, <laughs> it's a little strong. Right, no, that's interesting. So that basically means that you can use it for almost like, like in the old school when we would, uh, we would just improvise and just somebody would have a dat running or whatever and then you kind of go that was good but that but this makes finding those things a lot easier by the looks of it well that's exactly it. it it could be that you've got a percussion loop that's just too long or something you want to fold around and use the different elements of it it could be that you've got something that you want to transform into something lightly rhythmical i mean once i unsolo this you know the funny thing is nothing sounds like a loop until it's repeated and then everything sounds like a loop. Right. So it's a different way of maybe making an interesting starting point that's unexpected to build something on top of. Nice. But yeah, comping's a fun technique. It's it's nice to put something new into it and, and try something new out of it. So comping is one part of all this, and the other part is operators. Um, Bitwig has been known for modulators and sound design and that sort of thing for a long time. So operators are basically to sequenced events, to notes and audio events that are on the timeline, what modulators are to parameters. It's a way of controlling how and when things get triggered and you can actually make the sequenced events dance a little ah, bit and change okay. So that's the general approach and if I unsolo for a second, we had some drums going in the back. So we've got this here. Now the interface might start to look a little bit different because we have these icons painted on the notes and some different things showing up, coming and going. Uh, there's basically four modes of operators and they control how and when events are triggered. That means notes. It also means audio. Um, we can look at notes for now because the drums are probably an easy way to, to take a quick peek at it. Um, 
if I were to select all of these, I have a whole category in the inspector called operators representing the four modes, which we'll touch on each of them briefly. If I were to go ahead and just disable all of this for a minute and listen to the drums as regular flat, always happening notes, here's what I get. And undoing all that again, Right. Some sound design elements in there. There's there's a lot going on, and we can just take a minute and maybe look at a few of these. Um, I'd like. So we got the drum machine. Maybe I'll start with this hi hat, and I'll just solo it. Of course, it's a hi hat. Of course, it's on sixteenth notes. Of course, there's some other way to do this. So if I were to go ahead and select all of these notes, the first operator is chance. Uh, how likely something is to happen, basically setting probability. So if I were to go ahead and drag this value down, yes, you are seeing a dice icon on the notes. Uh, we could also see it down here because it ah. has its own expression editor too. So basically the bigger numbers are more likely to happen between one and five, just to give you some rough visualization on the event so you can read it. And more interestingly, if I, if I deselect the notes, now you see all the notes look perfectly painted, but once I hit play, some of them are going to dim out because they're actually not going to happen. And I can see that before I even hear it. So there's a visual feedback element to this as well, trying to indicate I'll when it loops that. around a different result. And that seems to change each time you go around the cycle. So as you go around, it kind of gives you yet another uh exactly another set of okay right exactly now the probability it's all or nothing it's yes or no so that's interesting but a different idea that we tried as well if i were to take this and go ahead and put these back to 100 percent, so now rolling 16th notes all the time um if i switch over to the velocity of this i do now have this concept called spread which is showing up throughout um, expressions in Bitwig, which are the event automation points. Um, if I go ahead, I'm going to hit stop for a minute. If I go ahead and turn this spread up, you start seeing what kind of looks like highlighters painting on the screen. Uh, yeah, nice bit. visualization though. I can, I can un immediately understand that. To, thank you, to reflect the range of possibility. Um, and once I start hitting play, just like the, the, the chances up top showing you which notes were happening or not, this firms up and it will actually start showing you the patterns of what velocity is being picked for each note. So you can see on screen where it's going high, where it's going low, and just trying to put a premium on the interface so that it really feels connected and feels more like an instrument. And, and, I gotcha. Is it possible, it. say say there's a, a, a cycle that you really like and you go, I want that, can I keep that? Is it, or is it always mm -hmm. changing? Well, there's two ways to do it. Um, by default, these clips, something new that we have is a seed parameter on every clip. Now, without getting into the craziness of where do random numbers come from, spoiler alert, they don't really exist. We have to generate random numbers. So if right now it's set to be completely random, every time it's a new day, it's picking a new value, everything is new. If I were to go ahead and click on here, and say, well, I want to generate a value that is repeatable. It's not that the number is helpful to me, but it's just once I hit play now, I see a certain pattern. And once I hit stop and hit play, I'm going to see the exact same pattern again. Right. So it's a way of basically casting the die and saying, well, this is what I want to work with. Or maybe I want to trend. I like the randomness, but now it's time to transform it into a song. And I want it to be a little bit predictable. Um, whether you ever touch this parameter or not, one thing that's very handy is if I'm printing a performance into the arranger from the clip launcher, like just trying to print exactly what I did performance-wise, it automatically captures all the seeds. So for these randomized parameters, when you hit play, you will hear exactly the same thing that you did when you hit record. Right. Uh, okay. so it's 
kind of that it's always you know the cat's always trying to catch his tail it's a little bit tricky but but here it's just trying to provide it to say oh you liked what you heard you responded on the fader based on what you heard well now you're going to hear the same thing when you play it back ah, okay i understand um and of course i could you know there's no either or i could do some velocity spread and some chance to say well drop out some of the notes but just let them fluctuate a bit as well um that's one way to do it a different idea altogether if I go ahead and I'm going to select this clap for a minute. This one looks funny and it didn't trigger because there's a recurrence parameter here that lets you say, I would like individual notes to think on different loop cycles. So this simple clap is saying, okay, think in a pattern of two and only play on the second time it passes around. So I'm looking at a two bar loop here but I'm actually working with at least four bars of data once you start thinking about it, which is a nice place to be. It's nice to focus on a small amount of material and actually be creating something that changes and evolves over time. Um, one other example tied to that that might be the most obvious example, here's the crash symbol. So I'm gonna add that to the clap so we can hear both for now. What is the crash symbol set to? Oh, please play on the fourth one and then do not play every time this two bar clip loops around. <laughs> so. Right. It'll be triggered the first time around. And now it's going to wait a while, and I didn't have to expand or print my clip out to be longer. I, I can just manage these relationships here. Um, if I want to take it a step further, I can actually connect the different operators together. I could tell it, let's make sure. Yes, it did happen. The crash symbol did happen. Um, I could go ahead and tell it, I have this other operator mode called occurrence, which is basically conditions. And this, in some ways, this is the simplest one because it's just a flat menu with no parameters. It's just saying, when is this gonna happen? Um, for this note, yeah, I like it every four, but if I'm performing, maybe the second I trigger the clip is not when I want the crash symbol to hit. So I could go ahead and say, well, the first time, never play on the first time but then every four after that. Now you're just starting to kind of pile up logic. It's simple enough when you think of it in a musical. Yeah. That's really interesting because uh, I was reviewing some hardware sequencing and one of the most powerful things I found for that was this kind of notion of probability where you just kind of go, well, I've got this beat. I like the way it feels, but maybe I want the, I want to drag out my one bar bit of inspiration to last for eight or 16. And that that's kind of, you could do that very easily with this setup by the sounds of things. Yeah, and one thing I find nice is I'm still staring at two bars. Like, I can manage this in my head and control it and see the icons, and but I'm still kind of painting on a bigger canvas. And that, yeah. that's, that's a little bit um, So the next thing I might talk about is repeats, which is the one we haven't talked about yet. It's the fourth mode here. It's a little bit more of a sound design tool. So. So this, now it has some probabilities, so I'm gonna turn that off. I just want every note to happen all the time. What is happening? I have six notes selected, and each one of them is actually repeating at some interval inside of it. So I'm controlling a single note, but saying re-trigger at a certain rate, or cut itself into an even number of pieces. Why don't I just go ahead and select these two? So now we can visualize it and make sense of it. The first note, these are just uh, quarter notes in reality. The first note is saying, play every 16th note. Now I could easily right click over here and say, I wanna pick a different metronome value. So it becomes a different way, just working with small notes, but managing when they happen. Um, and what's over here to the side of it? Well, you don't always want the timing to be perfect. Sometimes you want to bend the timing for certain effects like ratcheting and other things. Or even telling it, well, the velocity of this should really ramp up over time and I want to give it a little bit of a curve. So there's all these different ways of interacting with the repeats that become pretty manageable because I'm just sitting here with a few notes and then I'm able to control yeah. them over time to print them and manage like the 70 repeats I just wanted to create. Great one for the sort of tweaky beat uh, people. Um, so can you do this at a kind of bigger level? So if you have like a fill 
on the timeline. Can you mm -hmm. just say the whole pattern, only play this at, uh, on a turnaround of every 32 bars or whatever, rather than have to do it for every single individual note within that? Is that possible? Sure, sure. I mean, this could be layered up just as easily. I could go ahead and take that repeat there and say, yes, I want you to think in a recurrence pattern of eight and only the last iteration or maybe the fifth one too. I mean, you can make these relationships because in the end it's just saying, if it's not gonna happen, that's fine. If any one of these uh, parameters says don't happen, it's not gonna happen. Um, but they can layer up this way and say, well, only on these do we have a chance of happening. Only when this occurs do we think about it. Um, and that becomes different. I, I actually like where you're going, and I want to think of it in a slightly different way for a minute. If I look at these last two instruments down here, let's go ahead. what are these? Oh, well, I've got a kick, and I've got a snare that I am never hearing, because these little icons here from the occurrence mode are telling me, oh, when Phil is on or when Phil is off. Well, Phil is a global performance control. If I look up in the header here, I have this little kind of drum plus button. Yeah. So now if I just uh, solo these two and hit play, I'm only hearing the kick until, and now I'm only hearing the snare in these moments, which does have some repeats on it in the end. Um, Nate. And all the other events, they don't care about the fill status. So they're just going to play or not, depending on the logic that was in there already. So it's just a different way. You know, it's one thing to say it's every 32 bars, but it might be different to say, I just want to MIDI learn this one button on my controller and have it affect everything, whether we're in this alternate timeline or not. So you can kind of just shift paths whenever it's controlled. Interesting. And I suppose what you could do there is you can create uh, like a, a pattern in the the second timeline, which is this kind of clip trigger that is just the same pattern, but with a whole different set of probabilities and, and kind of operators applied to it, right? Oh, totally. I mean, you could you could think of this in a lot of different ways. There, there's other ways to set relationships between events and all this sort of thing. There, there's layers upon layers. Um, but if we want to go back to just a, a core Bitwig example for one second, I mean, devices, modulators, all of that. It might be that when this is triggering, I do have this fill mode on or off. There is one new uh, modulator that came along this time, and it is called Globals. And to prove that it is global, I'm going to put it on a different track. It's not on the drum track where all that fill programming was happening. I could just now say, well, you know, maybe when that fill button gets pressed, uh, the bass sound should adjust its uh, cut off a little bit, should do this, or even, I don't know, take some randomization on the, the sync knob of the oscillator and now normal. Once I press this, So this so is it really, really is sorry I was going to say this this is really powerful for perhaps when if you're performing and you've got your basic material but you want a certain amount of life and adjustment in it as you're going along I mean it seems that it works or does it work just equally as well for compositional stuff Well it works it, it it works both ways I mean if I were to go ahead and just um pull this clip up again that we were looking at the clip view saw it as a two bar loop that was just happening, but the track view sees this looping over the course of a whole song. So I could just as easily kind of zoom out and look at what's going on, see when things are happening or not happening. If I like it, I can hit consolidate and start with something that's more permanent. There, there's just a lot of different ways oh, to hey, yeah. approach it. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of detail there, actually, but there's kind of, it's, it's an interesting, it's almost like a maths based update. I quite like the fact that that, this whole, whole logic kind of uh, uh, set up for it. It's, so, um, when when and where and how this is, this is out now. So, I guess it's all part of the people who've got the update plan. And how does that all work? Yeah. Anybody with an active upgrade plan, download it today, start using it. It works if you do not have an active upgrade plan. Uh, 
I would like to tell you that it was $399 or euros to start with Bitwig in the first place. Um, well, but right now we are having a sale, so that's $299 for the time being. So that's 100 bucks if you're interested right now. But it's all in there. It's, it's part of the program and it's ready to go today. So one thing I wanted to ask, um, because you, you've been multi-platform for quite some time, what's the situation with the new M1 processors? Well, with any of uh, with any of the three platforms we support, we're just trying to follow where they go. So that was Touch OS for Windows and Linux. For Mac, now they've got ARM. So with version four, Bitwig natively runs uh, on Apple Silicon. No Rosetta necessary. Uh, one thing that makes it interesting for us is that we've always had a unique plugin hosting structure where these things are managed separate from the program. So if you start up Bitwig using ARM, if you have ARM plugins, uh, those VSTs are gonna work fine. If you have Intel VSTs, those are gonna work too because we host them separately and we just let the translation happen on part of it and, and it works out. So um, at least for me, I'm just not even keeping track of who's updating their plugins anymore and that just makes my life a little bit easier. Well, Dave, thank you so much for showing us this. I guess uh, available now, bitwig.com, all of the usual channels. And uh, you, now, you, now you've put this update out, does that mean you get to have a holiday and take a break, right? I, I will consult with the people who let me out of this room. I haven't talked to them in many years. But <laughs> I think we're good. It, it, it's fun to work on this, and it's nice to do, to do something that turns into music. So thanks, Nate. Well, thanks for talking. You're welcome. See you next time, hopefully in person soon. Indeed. Pints on me.